This chart describes the essential components of a calcium homeostatic mechanism. And in any homeostatic mechanism, there's some fairly important parts. One of those parts is what is it called when homeostasis drops too low or goes too high? What are the causes of homeostasis getting too low or too high? What are the effects of too low and too high? And then how is the body going to remedy this situation? How is it going to correct this deviation from homeostasis? One of the first things I'd like to do, though, before we get into this more deeply, is talk about why calcium is important. Why do we care about this homeostasis? And I'll start right here with bone formation because that's probably the easy one, as everyone knows that you need calcium in order to make bones. Your muscles pull on that and things like that, so you definitely need your bones. Cardiac muscle action potential is also, there's a little diagram of it up here, but remember during the plateau, during phase two, calcium is entering the heart muscle cell in order to cause contraction and cause contra contractile strength. It's also involved in the pacemaker potential. Remember, calcium enters to depolarize the pacemaker cell, the autorhythmic cell, and so calcium plays a huge role in setting the pace of the heart. Synaptic transmission, calcium came up there because calcium enters the presynaptic terminal to actually cause neurotransmitter to be released. Also, calcium is involved in muscle contraction because calcium binds to troponin to pull tropomyosin out of the way so actin and myosin can interact in cell contraction. When sperm meets egg, there's a huge wave of calcium that repeatedly goes over the cell. It also is involved in hormone release. A lot of hormones can't be released unless there's calcium present. While we started on bone, let's end on that too, because sometimes we'll form bone where we really don't want bone. As in the case of gallstones, arteriosclerosis is hardening of the arteries, and then kidney stones as well. So regulating calcium is important because we have several functions we need to do, but we also can't let it get so high that we form bone where we don't want bone. The first thing we'll do is we'll start naming things, and too low of calcium is called hypocalcemia, and too high is called hypercalcemia. There are a few causes of hypocalcemia. The first one is fairly easy. If there's not enough vitamin D or not enough calcium in the diet, deficiency of calcium can result. So vitamin D deficiency can come from a lack of the vitamin in the diet or lack of exposure to the skin, since the skin makes vitamin D. Alkalosis can also cause hypocalcemia. The reason for this is that albumin is a large protein that's made by the liver and circulates in the blood. Here's a diagram of one. And essentially it's got lots of negative charges that need to be balanced by positive ions like calcium and hydrogen. If the body's alkalotic, there's less hydrogen to balance these negative charges, so albumin binds up more calcium. This loss of free calcium then causes hypocalcemia. Thus, any condition that can cause alkalosis can cause hypocalcemia. So if I can drop down here, then I can point out that there's a fairly complex relationship between potassium, hydrogen, and calcium. If there's any imbalance of potassium or any imbalance of hydrogen, then that can throw off calcium. Let's say there's a decline in potassium. Then potassium will leave the cell to balance out the loss of potassium outside the cell. Hydrogen will go inside the cell. That will cause hydrogen to jump off of albumin, freeing space, for calcium. That will cause a decrease in calcium concentration. So anything that decreases potassium will decrease hydrogen ion and that will decrease calcium. On the other hand, if there's an increase in potassium, it will run into the cell, kick off hydrogen. That hydrogen is going to go over and bind to the albumin and kick the calcium off. So now an increase in potassium will increase hydrogen ion concentration or decrease pH, and that'll increase calcium. So there's this fairly complex relationship between, then between potassium, hydrogen, and calcium. It's one of the reasons why you're actually recommended if you've got muscle cramping. This will make more sense once we get over here and talk about how hypocalcemia causes muscle spasms. Well, if you have hypocalcemia, what you can do is increase your acid. So drink pickle juice. You can increase your calcium by drinking milk. And you can also eat more bananas to increase your, increase your potassium. All of those are going to help with muscle spasms. At least anecdotally, that's true. Burns can also lead to hypocalcemia. Here it's a bit counterintuitive because if you've watched the video on potassium, we learned that cell damage leads to a release of potassium, which causes acidosis. And alkalosis is actually what causes hypocalcemia. The difference here, though, is there's lots of phosphate inside of a normal cell. And when that cell is damaged, that phosphate's going to be released. Calcium likes to bind up phosphate. So that extra phosphate is going to bind up that calcium and cause hypocalcemia. Hypernatremia can also cause hypocalcemia because the reuptake of sodium is dependent on sodium reuptake in the proximal convoluted tubule of the kidney. In hypernatremia, the kidney is less able to pull sodium from the filtrate and put it into the blood. This means less water is able to follow that sodium. That means there's less of everything else that can follow that sodium, follow that water, follow it from the filtrate back into the blood. So we have less sodium reabsorption. We have less calcium reabsorption, and that's going to cause hypocalcemia. 
Similarly, an increase in high blood pressure would cause the GFR to be really too high. So glomerular filtration rate will go up. That's going to mean that there's not enough time to reabsorb that calcium. That means calcium will be excreted in the urine, and that's going to cause hypocalcemia. So increased blood pressure also causes hypocalcemia. If we turn our attention to hypercalcemia, we can assume that the imbalance of vitamin D can also lead to hypercalcemia. So if there's too much vitamin D, that also can lead to hypercalcemia. Acidosis, again, is the opposite of alkalosis. So in this case, acidosis and anything that leads to acidosis, like tissue damage, can also lead to hypercalcemia. Again, remember that albumin carries negative charges that need to be balanced by either hydrogen or calcium. If there's an excess acid, it binds to the albumin, kicks the calcium off, and that's going to increase blood calcium, causing hypercalcemia. Pantes disease is a disease of osteoclast and osteocyte imbalance. Remember that osteocytes and osteoclasts are both cells in bone, and they have opposite effects on whether you make bone or take up the calcium. An osteocyte actually takes extra calcium and makes bone. An osteoclast will dissolve calcium out of bone to increase calcium concentration. What happens in Padet's disease is there's an imbalance there that eventually results in the osteoclast taking over. So you're constantly resorbing, taking calcium out of the bone, releasing it into the blood, causing hypercalcemia. In hyponatremia, there's an increased drive to reuptake substance from the filtrate to the blood and the proximal convoluted tubule of the kidney. Less sodium in the blood allows the sodium potassium ATPase to concentrate sodium to a higher degree. Water follows the sodium and other substances follow the water. Since there's more sodium in water moving then, it's going to be a greater movement of calcium as well, leading to hypercalcemia. If you need a little clarification on that, you might want to watch the video that I've just created, I haven't put on YouTube, but it should be there by now on the proximal convoluted tubule, where I talk about the dependence of every other ion on sodium's concentration. If there's high sodium, then there's less reabsorption of everything else. If there's low sodium, then there's more reabsorption of everything else at the proximal convoluted tubule. Just as increased blood pressure decreased calcium, a decreased blood pressure will give the kidneys more time to reabsorb this calcium, so you might end up reabsorbing too much calcium, causing hypercalcemia. With cellular potassium release, the cellular potassium release can cause acidosis, and that acidosis then can cause hypercalcemia. 